the beauty of something like Atmos is that the same mix gets scaled to what what system you have. It's it's looking at you. Oh, you're on a phone with headphones. We're gonna play you know a binaural two speaker mix version of the same mix that's gonna simulate that. Or if you've got a sound bar, and you're like, okay, you've got one sound bar with nothing in the back, and we'll call that a three dot one system. At, left center right with a subwoofer and it will take the things instead of just saying okay you don't have those speakers we're not going to play those parts it it down mixes the audio and says you know what i'm going to take the things in the sides and the rears and we're going to put some of that up mm -hmm. here and as as mixers we're listening to those different what they're called fold downs in this case if i mixed it on you know 21 speakers or something i need to listen to what that that you know 3.1.2 or whatever it is a uh, smaller system is going to do and it it frees the consumer up of going you know what i just need i want this kind of version or i want two speakers or you know i'm going to buy a couple more or i'm going to do this other thing you're still hearing the full mix in different versions just like we've worked in stereo for a million years and you go to the club and it's in mono most of the time, you mm -hmm. know, and nobody's mad, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? No, they want bass. <laughs> bass is best in mono, yeah, exactly. let's face it. <laughs> but but even uh, even not in the club, you yeah. know, you're listening on your back in the, you know, not too long ago, phones were mono and whatnot. And sure. you're, you're just like, let me put my Bluetooth speaker up and it's mono. And it's like, it's the song, I dig it. And we were checking in mono. We're doing the same thing that if you've got stereo, you get that experience. Um, if you've got, you know, a lot of speakers, you get a lot of a different experience and you can kind of unfold the room, so to speak, and be as immersed in the middle of it as you want. And if you're really serious, like we can go. And in those days, people had to have a clip. That's more what I mean. I'm not going to do something that isn't me. Okay, what's my next move? A willingness to play and collaborate. With Greg Gordon. Hello, and welcome back to the Mentor My Mix podcast, where we talk about different career arches in the music industry. There's so many ways and so many paths to success. And in this podcast, we really get to explore so many different approaches that people take to finding their success and also just to finding their niche. We live and work in such a niched industry now. It's really important to understand what's your place and where do you really shine in this industry? And in this episode, I'm here with McKay Garner, somebody who's really found his place in the industry, and he really knows how to shine. This is somebody who I had the great privilege of meeting during my tenure on the Board of Governors uh, with the San Francisco chapter of the Recording Academy. Uh, we got to know each other a little bit then, and we've stayed in touch over the years. And recently, I got to visit his uh, home studio over in the East Bay. Um, I was really impressed. This is not your average home studio, folks, okay? This is like the real deal. An Atmo studio uh, to boot, and we're going to talk about that today, too. So really, um, it's my pleasure to introduce McKay Garner here on the Mentor My Mix podcast. Mm, thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so, so nice to have you here, uh, McKay. Let's talk about uh, your time studying at the University <laughs> of North Carolina, the School of the Arts there. Okay. How did that influence you? Um, you know, at the same time I was at the School of the Arts, I, that's a very uh, classical program. Um, so orchestras, percussion ensembles. I was a, I was a percussion major, but you're, you've got to learn kind of a lot of things, theory, ear training, yada, 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 mm. uh, music, right? That that's great. Cause you were classically trained in many regards. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're doing that during the day before that I was in like some youth orchestras in during high school, uh, while I was playing in marching band and those kind of things. So I'm playing in this is in North Carolina, and the marching band is very much like a dancing, like North Carolina AT and T, like gospel, soul, funk, drumline kind of marching band, doing youth orchestras uh, at the School of the Arts, which led to eventually applying to the School of the Arts and doing a classical program. But I'm playing in a funk band at night, so the the worlds of music were just like, you know, it's chords, it sounds, it's textures, it's legato it's snappy it's groove it's all the things you know so yeah well at the end of the day it's all music it's right? all music and uh -huh. it's it's energy you know what i mean oh so, yes i do yeah. yeah most definitely yeah so yeah a lot of that school of the arts um was playing in orchestras and studying very 
specific things I and mean, doing juries in front of people where you're auditioning in front of a group of professors and mm -hmm. they're checking you out and see if see if your technique's right and mm -hmm. if you played every single note and so. well the more producers i talk to these days the more i realize how much the producer mind has to embrace both sides yeah right how, yeah, yeah. how you've got because we know and understand now more than ever how mathematical music is yeah we're talking frequencies. Yeah, yeah. We're talking intervals. We're talking numbers, all left acoustics, and right. Acoustics, yeah, yeah. Right? And the acoustics and the mm -hmm. psychoacoustics. And, and so, yeah, that's why I asked that question because I'm finding it very interesting now to hear how people respond to that. Because it used to be people were like, oh, math, no way. Right, 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 right. And it was purely emotional. It was, it was yeah, just, yeah. you know, you pulled in by the emotional totally. context and, you know, the, the desire, the passion that goes behind that. Yeah. But nowadays, it's really a, a, a very obvious combination of those two. So at what point did the light go on? And you're like, you know, this is what I really want to do. And, and, and when did that connect to the studio recording experience? Yeah, um, definitely the music thing was just straight up in my bones. I couldn't, couldn't shake it off. I just knew early on, for, er, very early on, it was visual art. And then it moved into music was just moving me so i knew straight away um as far as production goes um you know i'm in school and i'm playing this this funk band and this was the advent of and this was still in north carolina still in north carolina okay. at the time this uh -huh. is like <clears throat> 80s into the early 90s got it uh -huh. a couple minutes ago uh -huh. and midi was brand new oh yeah synthesizers are popping up well, that would have been mid '90s, right? Midi, uh, '84, I think. Oh, okay, mid '80s. What am I thinking? Yeah, yeah. mid '80s. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um. But you know, <clears throat> my buddy bought a Juno 106 when it first came out mm -hmm. from the mall mm -hmm. at like double retail or whatever the mall charges, <laughs> and let me borrow it. You know, and mm -hmm. I was like, "What's going on?" And my my the other keyboard and the player in the band, they were both keyboard players. Eventually, in the band years later, and uh, he bought a a Roland D20 that had an eight track sequencer. I remember that. And yep. you're immediately like, I'm a producer now. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We yeah. could record stuff mm -hmm. and play it back. And that, that changed my world. Just like the, you know, um, someone these days who picks up Ableton or something, they're like, whoa, the power of the creativity of this. Mm -hmm. It was like that for me mm -hmm. back then. And I did my first demo for an artist with my buddy Carl Beatty, um, probably in the late 80s to cassette. So at what point then did that creative spark get you to write a tune? Like thinking like, oh, I can write songs and maybe I could even write them for other people too, right? Yeah, I, I think early on it was not that I can write songs, more that I could write songs, so let me go for it. And I didn't really know how to write a song. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just like anybody learning a bunch of classical etudes for practice or somebody learning cover tunes and doing them on YouTube, that's a study in itself, you know? So I, sure. I feel like early on, like playing a bunch of cover tunes, you, you start to learn how to build song flow and framework of a song and how it goes from intro verse chorus when you put a pre-chorus when's the bridge why <laughs> you know well it's kind of, like learning from the best in the world yeah yeah exactly right i mean you're able right. to then dissect those tracks and yep. and learn them from the inside out and then yep. you're like oh i think i get this yeah right? yeah that's definitely. that's a great way to go for yep. sure so uh, let's just fast forward a second so we could play, get get uh, our listeners kind of vibing on some of the stuff you're up to these days. Right on. Um, and we can talk a little bit about this track. This You told me this is a pre-master, right? Something yeah, that's just exactly. coming out of the Coming out of the oven here? Coming project, out of the oven. Recent. Yep. Uh -huh. And this is with an artist named Ben Flanagan? Yeah, fantastic. He has a, he has a killer rock band called Black Map. Mm -hmm. um, most excellent singer from the Bay Area. Now, what, what was your, uh, what's your role in this song? Just so, so we're, we're clear. Co-production, uh, added a bunch of things, mixed the track, rearranged a couple things, recorded a few new things, and then mixed it in. This will be the stereo version. Just finished the first draft of the Dolby Atmos version. Um, okay, so this just to note is not an Atmos or binaural mix. We're gonna get to that. Yep. You got it. We've got a cool track for you to play, uh, an Atmos binaural track coming up. But this is not. This is this is in stereo, and this is uh, Ben Flanagan. It's a track called Bright Dark. Yep. Right. Yep. 
What kind of processing are you using on on the vocal on the mix here? Uh, let's get it. What's 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 happening here? That's getting it to sound so nice and present. Yeah. So um, constantly using your basic parallel compression EQ, etc. Uh -huh. Do some widening with various micro pitch shift stuff. Uh, delays and different types of reverbs. Sometimes sometimes delays into reverbs. Uh, may swatch switch that up for different sections. There's doubling going on. There may be different treatments on the doubles or octaves. And so things the, like that. the the doubling though is that not him doubling it or are you doubling it digitally? It depends on the section. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like there's some doubling going on here a bit. Uh huh. On the big words. Right where he doubles it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Th th that's a good example of the orchestral textures of timbre of the one vocal being a little more you know trumpet and these guys being flutes they're lighter and oh, airier yeah, 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 that's you know nice. what I mean yeah makes for some really nice texture I think so uh-huh any favorite compressor you like to use on the vocals depends on the vocalist all, uh, and the recording a lot yeah. you know if it's always if it's already kind of gritty or something I may choose something cleaner um, it depends on if I'm going for a very pop Squash the vocal tucked underneath in parallel, or if I want something grittier. How about on this one here? Uh, if I remember, this is probably a blue 1176 kind of vibe that's Universal Audio UA. Or? Uh, no, that was probably a slate uh -huh. plug in going into maybe their clean opto uh -huh. classic L 1176 yeah. LA 2A, but. It's, it's great to work on something like this every day when you come to work. You're like, good music all the time is like the day the hours go by really quickly, you know? Yeah. Sweet. Really nice track, McKay. Thank you. Uh-huh. So talk about that. What, what What is that like, showing up to work for you? What does that mean? <laughs> what, what's it mean when you, you show up to work in the morning? Because um, yep. as I mentioned earlier, you, your studio is right in the back of your house, mm -hmm. right? And yep. I remember not too long ago, you were posting lots of pictures mm -hmm. about the whole build sure. process yeah, yeah. That you were doing out there. It was quite a process that you yeah, went yeah, through. Yeah. Um, what made you decide to do that? Initially, I was just going to build a mix room and get it up and running pretty quickly. But I'd been doing a lot of drum sessions here and there for a producer friend of mine here in the Bay Area that's amazing. So, of course... There's a big difference between building a mix room in soundproofing and building a drum room, <laughs> you know. So. And it's a drum room in your mix room. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Uh -huh. So it goes from, you know, this is going to take me a month or two to set it up for a mix room to like, this is going to take some months because we're talking like five layers of drywall and green glue and building double doors and all that stuff. So um i thought that that was a wise move and still do it worked out great mm -hmm. ended up doing a, i mean the whole world shut down right at the end of my build so went straight into remote mode and i've got cameras by the kid cameras for mixed clients by my console section and whatnot so uh I think no, was, so the timing really could yeah, have been better in many ways in some ways yeah. for sure yeah uh -huh. so how many you ended up in and out of a lot of studios in la during that time period huh uh yeah especially the early time period and then i you know i had i was working on demos for someone and they were like i want you to produce my record um i'm gonna buy a ton of gear when when i think when pro tools went 24 bit for the first time mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're gonna go from tape to non-linear world and uh He's like, I'm going to buy all this gear. Let's get a studio. You can work on my record these days and take clients the other days. And I was like looking around at what I'm doing. I'm like, ah, okay, let's go, you know? So built a studio in Pasadena, did that for a minute, and then built a bigger studio um, in what's called Atwater Village in LA and ran that for 10 years in LA. And I think a lot of my career really started to jumpstart and get further um, just by doing bands and solo artists and producing singer songwriters or bands part of the week and then just taking recording, you know, the rest of the week. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really valuable point. I'm going to put a little exclamation point on it <laughs> because, you know, so many 
people these days are in their little home environment and they're staring at that computer screen, whether it's Logic or Ableton or whatever, and they just think that's going to make it all happen for them. And the big takeaway here is, you know, getting out there, mixing it up with other people, mm-hmm. hearing what other people are doing, having a community that you can lean into makes a huge difference. Right? Yeah. Huge. And, and having people willing to share, you know, yeah. I mean, there are a lot. Well, that's of, why I said I use the yeah. word community. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Hopefully, if they're in your community, they're, they're willing to share. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And there's definitely a lot of community that's like we're all musicians or we're all engineers, um, and some people, you know, they're like, I don't want to give away the the KFC recipe here on my thing because you know they got to survive and that's their sound. And you're like, okay, that I respect that too. Mm-hmm. And there's also like, uh, I can give you the. I can give you the map, but you're never going to drive this track the way I drive it. <laughs> so there is a little, there is definitely some of that, of course, right? Everybody's got their their little trade secrets, and that's your sound, yeah. right? You don't want to give it away. Totally cool. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I get that. I I think um, you know, there's a lot to be respected in that regard, but I think you know, overall, at the end of the day, the information and the knowledge to produce at a high level is something that you know it takes it takes time it just takes time and so you have to you know um go about accepting that you're going to make mistakes along the way and that you're going to learn by watching others succeed yeah and fail yeah and fail oh yeah oh definitely and and now um atmos atmos has become Mm -hmm. a real big deal in your world right i mean it's becoming a big deal period um it's being driven by a lot of label budgets that are now pushing that in terms of Apple and Dolby and and what they're trying to create mm-hmm. in terms of a whole new um, delivery mechanism. Yep. So what got you into it and what made you say that, you know what, I'm throwing down with this. I, I really believe, you know, I mean, we've seen so many fads come and go, Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. quad or, you know, I don't want to call 5.1 surround, obviously for theatrical mixing and home yep. theater. That's uh, that's the real deal, but I don't think it ever caught on for music, really. Yep. Yep. You know, the consumer is obviously king at the end of the day. They're going to make the decision yep. as to whether this is a viable medium or not. Yep. Um, but you're all in. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm a very visceral kind of, not that you aren't as well. Uh, we're just, we connect to some feelings. If, if, if something makes me feel good musically, you know, and I'm really connected to it, then I'm like, how can I do that? I felt like that with you know, some of the music I had worked on that wasn't really going to make me money or anything, but it's just like, it was, it was pulling me, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I heard early five, one, I heard quad back in the eighties, you know, of like Edgar winter Frankenstein or something, yeah. you know, uh-huh. I was like, this uh-huh. is sick, but uh, you know, I was very young and wasn't thinking that way uh, musically, technically, but, uh, there's a lot of great five one mixes that I was like, this is this is really cool. But my thinking was, you know, I had a five one system at home for movies that was really cheap. But I was like, this is cool. It's great for movies. But I wasn't listening to music that way. And no, I won't say nobody was, but the majority of people weren't. Right. No, but I know a lot of people and people we both mutually know in our community who were pushing it awful hard and five who were one. five one um yeah you know the uh, dvd delivery formats and yep. all of that yep. you know creating specs for it and yep. really pushing hard to make it a yep. you know white papers and all those things yep. um and I, it just you know it never happened you know as far as i can tell yeah, yeah. it happened to you know to a little blip of a yeah, degree yeah. Uh, but atmos is making a much bigger push of this i think obviously with yeah. apple deeply involved now um it's got a lot of legs and um you know i think for a guy like you who's really into sound design and idm like you were talking about and being on the cutting edge Mm. um you know this speaks well to what you can do um sonically with sound in in a way that we have never seen before and and i think that the kicker for me was the fact that you could do it in headphones Right? Yeah, this, that's that's really the just thing, the right scalability there. of it. Yeah. Five one was not scalable. You know? Right, right. If you didn't have those back speakers connected, yeah, you were out. You missed half the music. Sure, sure. You know, and the beauty of something like Atmos is that the same mix gets scaled to what what system you have. It's it's looking at you. Oh, you're on a phone with headphones. We're gonna play, you know, a binaural two speaker mix version of the same mix that's gonna simulate that. Or if you've got a sound bar. You're like, okay, you've got one sound bar with nothing in the back, and we'll call that a 
three dot one system at left center right with a subwoofer and it will take the things instead of just saying okay you don't have those speakers we're not going to play those parts it it down mixes the audio and says you know what i'm going to take the things in the sides and the rears and we're going to put some of that up mm -hmm. here and as as mixers we're listening to those different what they're called fold downs in this case if i mixed it on you know 21 speakers or something i need to listen to what that that you know 3.1.2 or whatever it is a uh, smaller system is going to do and it it frees the consumer up of going you know what i just need i want this kind of version or i want two speakers or you know i'm going to buy a couple more or i'm going to do this other thing you're still hearing the full mix in different versions just like we've worked in stereo for a million years and you go to the club and it's in mono most of the time, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody's mad. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? No, they want bass. <laughs> bass is best in mono. Yeah, exactly. Let's face it. <laughs> but, but even, uh, even not in the club, you yeah. know, you're listening on your back in the, you know, not too long ago, phones were mono and whatnot. And sure. you're, you're just like, let me put my Bluetooth speaker up and it's mono. And it's like, it's the song. I dig it. And we were checking in mono. We're doing the same thing that if you've got stereo, you get that experience. Um, if you've got, you know, a lot of speakers, you get a lot of a different experience. And you can kind of unfold the room, so to speak, and be as immersed in the middle of it as you want. So the scalability was like, uh, that's, a, that's a driving factor, but also- Well, that's the genius of Dolby. Here, yeah, yeah. Right? That, that's yeah. the genius of Dolby. So for people who don't really know what Atmos is, I mean, I think a lot of people have heard of it now. Sure but they don't technically understand what's going on. Can you just break it down for us in the basics? Like what is object-based mixing? What's the, what's the fundamental there? Right. Um, so conceptually, you're, you're able to look at a space kind of like a 3D dome and put a sound anywhere in that space you want as an object. And, and Dolby works with a couple different things and objects and beds, but it's, it's still eventually going to end up as objects. So if I have speakers that are all, you know, ear level and I have some on the ceiling, but I want to put something in between those and there's no speaker there. Similar to the way stereo, actually, you can hear a vocal in the mid middle through phantom I imaging. Um, you get a phantom center. If you don't have speakers, it does the math to go, okay, you got a speaker here, a speaker here, and a speaker here, and you want the sound to be there. It's seeing that as an object and then recalculating the mass so that these speakers can actually play the same source at a volume that will make a phantom image in different places. Mm -hmm. But if, if it is assigned as this object we're talking about and there is a speaker there, it will play it in the speaker. But if there isn't a speaker there, it'll redo the math to play it in a certain amount of speakers so it sounds like it's still there and that's all over the 3d space mm -hmm. interesting and if you were to say you know what's an optimum you know small environment setup for somebody who wants to put an atmos system in um is that the the four overheads yeah the minimum is seven on the ground uh -huh. four up top four up top and uh, and a sub, sub. yep exactly yeah. And the, how's the seven around? How's that? What's the spread on that? So it's usually left, center, right. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, a right sides around, mm -hmm. left sides around, right and left rear surrounds. And then you've got front, left, um, top, and then right, top, left, right, top. Mm -hmm. Where am I? <laughs> and then back, <laughs> Same thing, left, top. Rear, and... rear, top, left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's what you have in your setup, right? You have 714 currently probably going to 914 pretty soon, debating that move or not. But uh -huh. but that's the minimum uh, supposedly for officially mixing uh, in Atmos so that you can hear speaker translation. Right. Plus all the tuning and being able to control your uh, that many speakers, 12 speakers. But you can go up 914, 916, 11.1.6. Well, yeah, I mean, on. this is great for the speaker companies, right? Yeah, yeah, right. This is a good deal on the speaker company sure. side. They're like, sure, how many you want, son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you uh -huh. know, as creators, I would say j just always we've created 
And a lot of producers have created and they're like, I'm going to mix this in the studio. They're working on headphones or whatever. And of course, we can do way better with headphones than we ever could these days. But well, and so many people are listening that way, too. Now yeah, they're sure. listening in their earbuds. And, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a long time we, you know, we argued a lot about oh, earbuds and an MP3. Oh, my God. The worst case scenario. Yeah. But the earbuds have gotten a lot better now. Yeah, yeah. Right? And the ability to deliver a binaurally rendered mix. Tell us, tell us what that is. So this is, it's fascinating, you know, science has been working on human hearing for decades and decades trying to figure out how is it that we've got two ears and we know stuff is behind us or above us. Yeah, right. We've got a left and a right input and we're like, it's definitely up there, you know, it's over here. How do we know that? What is our brain doing? And initially it's like, okay, this is all brain stuff. But at some point you're like, oh, we're all anatomically built differently. It's an acoustics thing that you're getting reflections off your shoulders. The penne or the, the floppy part of your ears are different shapes. The holes that are going into the, the head hole, you know? Right. <laughs> all these things are affecting the sound just, just like this wood versus this wood or whatever. Everybody's got a different thing. And they on. call that HRTF, right? Head-related transfer function. Exactly. So that's a, a function of the physicality of your yep. head exactly. and your ears and how all that yep. affects the perception of what you're hearing. Now, what about, I, I know that there's now the ability to create a custom um, yep. head-related transfer function mm -hmm. based on your physicality, mm -hmm. right? And so that's kind of cool, right? Because then, that's then you're deal. really then you're not listening through a filter yeah. of somebody else's perception. Yeah, yeah. It's actually yours, yeah. right? And then theoretically, if you're streaming music off of a platform, yep. you could get your own HRTF measurement, upload it into yep. your playback system uh, off of where you're streaming, and now everything's customized to your HRTF. Yeah, yeah we've been talking about that for years. That one day. It's going to be just like when you get your phone is like, welcome to blah, blah phone. And you're uh -huh. like, put in your thumbprint, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. it, it'll, it's already starting. Finally, you see Apple with OS 14. I think they started doing the, Hey, take a picture of the left of your head right. and your right of your head. Right. Um, for the facial recognition. Yeah. Uh, right? Well, no, for, and, for this but person. But now special, yeah. applying that to HRTF. Exactly. Right? It started with facial recognition. It started there for, uh -huh. yeah, exactly. And now it's getting into what's going on with the side of your head. You know what I mean? Right. And now this is your music profile. And it's very similar to, you know, going to the optician or whatever. And they're like, is this better or is this better? You know, Interesting, they're, yeah. they're taking your anatomy and going, you know what? This person's a large. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna use the large ear uh -huh. and the, you know, this shoulder kind of thing. Or nearsighted, yeah, farsighted. Yeah. You've got your, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. your hearing profile is. Yep. So for me that that makes this so interesting. Yeah. Because now you we've got something that actually customizes the listening experience. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really exciting to me. And yeah. it makes it really viable in many ways, especially on, on the binaural side of things, because er, most everybody's got headphones, whether mm -hmm. they got, yep. you know, pods they're putting in, whatever, yep. you know, th it is. So, all right, we got a track here. Okay. We got I, I want you to talk about this track. Go this is like, okay. not only is this a really cool Atmos mix that's mm -hmm. got a really dope binaural mix going on here, but, and oh, by the way, make sure you put on headphones for this one. If you're not listening to headphones, you got to be listening to headphones. Headphones only. Headphones, sure. This is a uh, headphones. Ideally, yeah. Ideally. Um, so this is, not only is it a cool Atmos track, but it's some really cool sound design. Mm, this thank has got you. like some crazy ass cool shit going on. <laughs> um, before I roll it, why don't you just tell us a little bit about the track? Uh, this is a piece called Envelopes I did several years ago and conceptually was more Atmos in my head. You know, it's definitely sound design and playing in orchestras and things. You've got other instruments behind you and those, those kind of feelings are different when horns and strings are behind you versus in front of you and those mm -hmm. kind of things. So this was originally done in stereo, but thinking ahead in, in an immersive format. Um, it's based on a Rhodes piano. I'd just gotten a Rhodes piano and I was at a friend's house and I had set my iPhone on top of his Rhodes and I was just noodling around and recording some stuff to get back to where I was staying and I was listening and the iPhone had picked up the hammers more than everything. Like, I noticed that. Right. That's and I was like, oh my God, that's such a cool, like uh -huh. somewhere between music box and mechanical piano thing. Yeah. So I ended up, you know, recreating that the best I could. 
it actually had more fidelity when I re-recreated it, but I'm, I'm happy with it. Taking the lid off the roads, um, dual small diaphragm condensers, picking up the hammers, having the, the, I have the amp as well. So a little bit of the amp in the room, but you hear a lot of the, just to get more tone, more actual notes than hammers. So it's this blend of those two different recipes of what you're used to a, a road sounding like, that electric piano kind of smooth vibe with this kind of attack that's got felt, you know, hammers on tines. Yeah, yeah. And finding the blend of that where it's like, it's very mechanical and, and you'll hear, you feel really in the room and there's the hum of the speaker a bit and whatnot. And I think all that stuff is often, you know, Sucked out, uh, like sucked out, sanitized. less noise uh -huh. reduced, this kind uh -huh. of thing. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of music in those those things, you know. Let's check it out. This is, this yeah. is called Envelopes. Or env yeah, Envelopes, right? Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Thanks, man. <laughs> I'm like you, I want to drink that up. <laughs> it's cool. But, you know, I, it also, it, it really does speak, I think, to your, you know, kind of your pushing the boundaries of sound design. And it sounds like something you'd love to make, right? This is this is a passion piece of music here. Definitely, for sure. Yeah. Combining acoustic, the acoustic and electronic timbre that's built into both, you know. Mm -hmm. Previous big band and classical composers were using those timbres of layers of the the brash and the smooth and the attack and the sustain of different instruments to make feelings you know what i mean oh, yeah. you played one for me i remember when I, I sat down in your studio you played rocket man for me oh yeah i'll never forget Classic. that yeah yeah that now there there's yeah. a a reissue atmos yeah. mix that just blew my head off yeah same i thought that was just phenomenal uh, that was yeah. really impressive yeah not impressive. all of them hit like that though. yeah yeah <laughs> but like the the billy eilish uh when the party's over track is like that for me too it's like just opens that song and performance up and you're just like okay this is like a cool black and white drawing in stereo but this is a this is an experience that doesn't feel like an atmos demo it feels like this song's supposed to be this way yeah you know what i mean yeah 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 and, that's, and that makes that's huge that's, right there that's when you hit it you know. Yeah, for sure. McKay, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. you too, I could man. do this all day with you, man. All, all day. <laughs> yeah, same. I got to interview you. I'd be happy to do it, man. All right, McKay, thank you so much, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Mentor that. My Mix is made possible by Pure Mind Music and Audio Production Institute. Evolve your sound with expert trainers and up-to-date courses designed to fit the needs of emerging artists and producers. Go to puremind.com for details about the San Francisco campus and online programs. Remember, if you have a guest suggestion or want to contact me for any reason, we have a contact form on the Mentor My Mix website. That's mentormymix.com. Or feel free to email me at greg at mentormymix.com.